Sin is mercy are yours to all of you and me who sometimes turn from skeptic to doubtful about what our Lord and Savior has done for you and me. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, and with that, let's see a show of hands. Would you consider yourself a skeptical person? Are you one of those people that are not going to fully swallow everything that is given to you? You're the kind of person, and hands keep going up, going up, going up. You're the kind of person that when someone tells you something, you have to put it through your own set of checks to make sure that it works out. And if it does, then you will believe them. The word skeptic comes from the word skepasos, a Greek word. And literally that word means to consider something with hesitation. So you'll consider it, you'll believe it, but you've got to send it through a whole chain of things before you start to believe it. If you are that, then you are a skeptic. And I think all of us, at one point or another, to some level or another, have a dose of skepticism in their body. I think it's part of being, being an American. You know, when we were born from authority, when we were born from a monarchy, we were born with skepticism for power. And so I think there's part of us as Americans that say, you know what, because my mayor, because my legislature, because my boss, because my president says something, I'm not so sure I'm going to believe it until I verify it for myself. That, that's sort of inherited into us, to have a, a question authority type of feel to us. But with that, um, it's almost now to almost a survival tactic, something to keep us alive and keep us sane. You know, and here's sort of the, uh, you know, when I was your age type of story. When I was your age, when I was younger, when I was growing up, we had, if you wanted to be advertised to, you would have to open up a magazine, you'd have to open up a newspaper, watch a billboard, or listen to the radio, or, for me, we had five channels growing up, and you could tell in a half hour, three times every half hour, you could almost set your clock to it, when the commercials would come on. And so you would say, oh, here comes the commercial, and you can go do whatever you want. But nowadays, and I saw this figure, we are hit with advertising 6,000 to 10,000 times a day. A day. 6,000, 10,000 hits from people trying to tell us something, people trying to sell us something. Back in my day, you had the commercials at a specific spot. Nowadays, you watch TV and they'll have commercials at the bottom. You'll watch a sporting event and they won't even go to commercial. They'll just have the commercial on the right while you're still watching the game. Uh, here's a, a quick message from Sprint, whatever. And now we are inundated. We are hit with 6,000 to 10,000 ads every day. And just for sanity, we got to be skeptical of it, right? Is this toilet bowl cleaner really the best, like they say it is? Is this brand muffin really the healthiest, like they're claiming it to be? Um, does this really help my child, like they are promising that it does? And we have to send it through and be skeptical of it before we believe it. So, in some ways, skeptical is a good thing. But Satan loves skepticism. That, I would say, and I'll show you in a moment, <clears throat> I could say that is maybe his most favorite tools, his most favorite bullet of all bullets, to get you to be skeptical of people, to be, get you to start doubting people. He wants you to say, when someone comes up and apologizes to you, he doesn't want you to say, you know what, I forgive you, and go on with it. He wants you to be skeptical. You know what? You know why that person is apologizing to me? Because they got caught. That's the only reason. I don't believe that they're really sorry. You know why that person wants to be friends with me again? Because I don't have any other friends. Because they know they need me, and therefore I'm skeptical about this. <clears throat> he loves it when we are skeptical about other people. Oh, but he loves it when we are skeptical about God. When we say, you know what? I am not so sure that God is really speaking to me. I am not so sure that God loves me like he claims to do. I am not so sure about this. And he loves it because this, I would say, is his favorite and oldest bullet that he sends to us to try to get us to uh, commit spiritual suicide. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. And notice here, Adam and Eve are now in the garden. Adam now has the uh, walking papers. He has the commands from God. He has told Eve... 
And what does Satan come to do to try to break him away? Look at what he says. Satan says to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? So, skepticism. Did did God really say that? I'm a little skeptical that he really said that. Well, Eve said to the serpent, she she swats that away. It swats away the skepticism. We may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. And then Satan tries to cast doubt. Wait a second. He's, you're not going to surely die, the serpent said to the woman. Uh, let's be serious. God is, God is lying to you, isn't he? God is not telling you the truth. You can doubt what he said. Oh, sure, he said it, but you don't have to believe it. You can doubt what he is promising you because God lies to you. Because God doesn't tell you the truth. Because when God promises to do things for you, that he doesn't come and it doesn't happen. You can promise or you can be sure that God is lying to you and therefore you can doubt him. And that's what we're going to be talking about today because that very well could be you. Looking back in your life, you might have had a bedrock, a strong faith. You might have been that person that says, you know what, Jesus loves me, this I know, because the Bible tells me so and there's no other reason for me to wonder. God loves me, and I'm fine. But you have now seen too much, and you've read too much, and you've thought too much, and you've experienced too much for you to really believe that, and now you have doubts. If you're like me, there are times when you realize, you know what, I'm not certain as I used to be in God's truths. There are times when I wonder. There are times when I'm skeptical. And then there are really times when I actually doubt what God is promising. If you have ever doubted, if you do have doubts about what God promises, this is the message for you. Then I'm going to be talking to you today, if you have doubts, because we're going to go to someone who is going to teach us about doubt. We're going to go to someone who I would argue is maybe the most, one one of the most, maybe one of the top three most influential Christians that ever lived. He was one of the disciples. And he, historians have him, going into northern part of Africa after it was time for him to be evangelist. And he went to the northern part of where we would call Iraq and Iran, and all the way into India. I'm going to talk about uh, how he affected even this church a little later. But I would say that he had the biggest swath of influence of all the disciples that Jesus put out there. And yet, we don't know about him. We don't care and we don't think about that part of it. We think of him when he had two weeks where he was just paralyzed with doubt. That's the part we know of him. This man had a nickname. This man grew up with a nickname. And yet, we don't remember that nickname. We remember a nickname of that two bad weeks that he had in his life. So much so that virus say his name is Doubting. You would say his name is... Thomas. And all of us even use that today in our thing. Don't be such a doubting Thomas, right? A doubting Thomas. Here's a man who, when he was called by the Lord and sent out by the Lord, went to the places of Iraq, Iran, and brought the gospel into India. Maybe the biggest swath of land ever. He did. He was one that followed the Lord throughout his whole ministry. And yet, for two weeks, he is just overcome He is paralyzed with doubt, and that is what we remember him for. So I feel sorry for the guy, because I have doubts too. You have doubts. There are times when you wonder if God is telling the truth. There are times when you think, you know what, he's not telling the truth this time. He's not telling it to me. So we want to hear his story, and we want to hear how Jesus handled it, because that's going to be our hope, that when we see the risen Jesus today, that when we see the account of it, It's going to change our life to certainty, absolute certainty, and erase those doubtful temptations that come into our life. So with that, we are going to go to John chapter 20 for the account. This is going to be one of Jesus' 11 appearances. Now remember what happens after Jesus on Easter. He rises up and he shows himself no less than 11 times to his friends. You'll notice he never shows himself to his enemies. You notice he never goes to the Pharisees, those people that mocked him, ridiculed him, ignored him, uh, made fun of him. Never goes and shows himself to them. They have the word. They have enough. But to those who believed, 
to those he was friends with, he went to show them, to give them hope, because he likes them. And he wants to give them that hope so that they have a hopeful life now and for eternity. We're going to be peeking in on episode number six, the sixth appearance that he has as he appears to his friends. We're going to be going to the weekend. We're going to start with the weekend of Easter Sunday. And what we find is that Lazarus is not with the gang. The gang, as you know, is in the upper room. Because of why? With the door locked? Fear the Jews. They know that because they were followers of Jesus, they have labels and they have arrows on, or they have uh, um, crosses on them. They are going to be next. And Thomas isn't with them. Now, I'm going to be giving you three different theories today on, on this account. Three different calculated theories. I can't prove it in Scripture, but there are clues. There are clues to why things are happening here. And here's the first clue, or first theory, and I'll show you the clue. There's a real possibility that Thomas wasn't there because maybe he went back to work, went back and, you know, he was so depressed, he went fishing or did something else. But there's a, there's a theory out there that says he wasn't with the group, he was hiding on his own. He didn't want to get swept up with the others. I want to first take you to John chapter 11 and take a look at the attitude that he has. So then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there to see it so that you may believe, but let's go to him. Let's go to Jerusalem. And with that, let's go to the cross and let's go do my father's will. And Thomas knows what's in store. If Jesus goes to Jerusalem, he's going to be arrested and we're going to get swept up too. And so he says, then Thomas called Didymus, Greek word for identical twin. Then Thomas called Didymus, his nickname, said to the rest of them, well, let's go as well. Let's go, that we might die with him. He knew that this was a death sentence. He knew that if Jesus gets arrested, they get arrested. If Jesus dies, they all die. And he's got the idea of, I really don't want to go up there, but I guess we got to, and I know what's waiting for me, my arrest. And so there is a good idea or a good theory that he is hiding by himself. He doesn't want to get arrested with the rest. He doesn't want to be seen with Jesus or even seen with the disciples because he is very much doubting that God's in control. So with that, he's not with the, the boys on Easter Sunday. Now Thomas, as we go now to John chapter 20, which is what we're going to study, now Thomas called Didymus, his nickname. No one called him Thomas. They called him twin. He twin, identical twin. Obviously, he had an identical twin brother, not one of the disciples, but he was known as a nickname of twin, identical twin. Now Thomas called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So after the disciples saw Jesus, interacted with Jesus, they went to find their friend. They went to tell Thomas and let him know. And so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. They now have eyewitness accounts. You now have some eyewitness proof and testimony that Jesus lives. Jesus showed himself to other people so they, they would know these things. And they go and they tell him. But what did Thomas do? Thomas is a skeptic. And he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, I'm not going to believe it. So he wanted to see the hands that Jesus put out so that they could be nailed to the cross. He wanted to see those wounds. He wanted to see the foot wounds. And he wanted to see the wound that was in the side where he was stabbed. Now, Jesus was stabbed in the side for one of two reasons. Maybe the Roman soldiers had pity on him and just, you know what, this man suffered enough, and we're just going to kill him by putting a spear into his guts. Or we got to get him off the we got to get him off the cross. We got to get him home because because here comes the Sabbath, and God will be pleased with us if we get home by six at night. So we got to speed things up a little bit. But with that, then Jesus would have five wounds, five gaping holes: hands, feet, side, along with cuts on his skin, along with cuts on his back. And what he is saying is, until I see those, until I put my hands in those, I'm not going to believe it. Here's a second theory. <clears throat> he is known as identical twin. Um, of all people that know what it's like to have someone think they're talking to somebody, to have someone think they are 
know somebody and have that person wrong, it would be an identical twin. We have a set of identical twins right here, and they can tell you stories. I'm sure they can tell you stories of, oh, I thought I was talking to you. No, that's my brother. Oh, I thought that this was you. No, that's my brother. And my theory is, which I cannot prove, but it's a thought. What if he's thinking, guys, you think you're seeing Jesus. You're not seeing Jesus. It can't be Jesus. It can only be Jesus if I see his wounds. Only if I see that side then I will know it's Jesus. Because you want to talk about mistaken identity, no one knows better than an identical twin. And I'm wondering if that's going through his head. I have to see it. Because then I will know it's Jesus. But either way, he's a skeptic. He's a skeptic and he has doubts. And a skeptic is going to say, you guys are crazy. You guys are being delusional. Jesus is not alive. I've got to see it for myself. A skeptic is one that says, you're lying to me. You are lying to me. You are telling me untruths. I've got to see it for myself and put my hands in there to see it for myself. And then, then I'll be certain. Then I'll believe. So with that, he says, unless I see it happening, it's not going to believe. Fast forward to a week later when this happens. <clears throat> a week later. Now, the next Sunday. A week later, his disciples were in the house again for fear of the Jews. And Thomas now was with him. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. Jesus, being true God, has no problem walking through walls, melting through and just appearing. He is not bound by matter. He is not bound by gravity. He is not bound by any of these things. He is God. And therefore, he is allowed to do these things if he wants to. So again, just to show them that this is God, he just appears. doesn't have to knock on the door. That uh, locked door is unimpressive to our Lord. He appears and look at what he says the first thing he says is peace we are at peace God is at peace with you you are at peace with God even though these men were fearful and abandoned Jesus we're at peace and that's the same message for us that's the whole summary of the Bible that we have peace with God there was a time when we were bound for hell, but we have peace with God, and now our eternity is in heaven. There was a time when we were enemies of God, and because of Jesus, we are at peace with him, and we're friends with God, and God is friends with us. That is the entire message of Scripture is, you have peace. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you're struggling with, no matter your doubts, you have peace. Your Lord loves you, and God even likes you. So that's what his first thing he says to him. And then, out of, the, out of the group, he looks for Thomas. And he says to Thomas, here you go, I heard what you said. Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand. Put it in my side. Stop doubting. Believe. Now that you have seen it, stop the doubting. Stop the skepticism. Start living with certainty. And with that, he sure did. He went out and changed the world, brought the gospel to India. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God, my God, am I such a fool. My God, I should have just trusted. But also, my God lives. My God lives, and then everything that you said now is true. My God lives, that means I'm going to live. My God lives, that means I'm forgiven. My God lives, that I am truly now at peace with my Lord. My Lord and my God, how great it is to see you. Thank you for sending me and showing me. And then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And with that, Jesus disappears to appear later for the, 12th, or for the seventh uh, installment. So with that, let's answer a question. Where do you go with your doubts? Where do you go when you have doubts? Because I'm telling you, Jesus is not going to show up in your door. He's not just going to appear in your room and say, hey, you have doubts. Touch my hands. Touch my side. Hey, I know that you're struggling right now. I know that you don't feel certain about my truths. Here, touch my hands. Touch my side. Where do you go? John tells us as he closes out this chapter. He says, just so you know, and now he's talking to us. Jesus did other, many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book. So there are many things I didn't have the opportunity to write down for you. 
But these things are written so that you may believe. He's talking to us, straight to us. These things are written so that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and here's the so what. What's the big deal? So that by believing, you might have eternal life in his name. With that, we can live when we know God's word. We can live without fear. We know that tomorrow it will be okay because God is with us. We know what lasts for our eternity, that we will spend eternity with our Lord because he did everything for us. We aren't going to be able to put our fingers into his side. We're not going to be able to put his fingers and see his scars. But we have two things. We have his word. When we have his word, we have eyewitnesses. Eyewitnesses that saw his scars, that allowed himself to see the wounds. And when we see that, we realize that when Jesus is showing the scars, he's showing his lifetime of hard work. Jesus is showing the scars that said, I was willing to live for you. I was willing to go to the cross and have my hands punctured and my side punctured for you so that I can spend eternity with you. But those scars are also a map of his love. It shows us how much he loves us, what he was willing to do so that he could spend eternity with you forever. And so with that, we're not going to be able to see those for ourselves, but we have eyewitnesses, and then we have God's word. When we have God's word, we have everything. When you have God's word, you have a shield that bounces off Satan's accusations, that bounces off Satan's temptation. When you spend time in his word, you have a source, a source that tells you you are forgiven. Pastor didn't say so. My friend didn't say so. God said so. And with that, I know that I am completely forgiven. When you have God's word and when you spend time in God's word, you have answers, answers to marriage issues, answers to financial issues, answers to temptation issues, answers to when the world wants you to do something, but God wants you to do something else. You have answers. When you go into God's word, you have a map. You have a map to let you know what God wants from you and the joy that he has in giving you abilities and opportunities to go and reflect him and work for him and do things for him and advance the kingdom. When you go to, into God's word, you can go in there with your fears, you can go into there with your skepticisms, and you can find truth. You can find the truth that God has given to you. And ultimately, when you go in there, you hear again, not from pastor, not from your friend, from God himself, that you are a beloved individual, a beloved child of God, that God did everything for so that you can spend eternity with him. Let's go to that Lord. Let's go to our Lord and speak to him now in prayer.